Hello and welcome to Pathways, where you are invited to join me for a visit with leaders in personal development and cultural evolution. This is your host, Paul O'Brien. We are visiting with Lama Surya Das, author of Buddha Is As Buddha Does, The Ten Original Practices for Enlightened Living. Surya Das has spent more than 35 years studying Zen, Yoga, and Tibetan Buddhism with the great spiritual masters of Asia, including the Dalai Lama's own teachers. He is the founder and spiritual director of the Zogen Foundation in Massachusetts and worked with the Dalai Lama to establish the Western Buddhist Teachers Network. Surya is a best-selling author of many books, including Awakening the Buddha Within and Letting Go of the Person You Used to Be. Good morning, Surya, and welcome to Pathways. Good morning, Paul, and thank you. It's lovely to be here. Happy Father's Day. Thank you. Same to you and to all of you parents out there. Now, the Dalai Lama called you the American Lama, and I'm, did he mean that you're the only American Lama? No, but uh, I'm kind of a, the leading uh, Western Lama or, you know, one of the foremost or senior. And for those uh, in our audience who don't know what a Lama is, can you explain? Well, Lama generally in Tibet means teacher, priest, spiritual master, meditation master, and so forth. But this is not as foreign to us as we might think. I'm sure you remember, Paul, at your age, uh, Ogden Nash from The New Yorker in 1917. Absolutely. Yeah, you probably subscribed at that time. Yeah, it was a previous lifetime. <laughs> Ogden Nash said, he, he knew about Lamas, he said, with one L, he's a priest. With two L's, he's a beast. <laughs> you know, Yama. But I'll bet a pair of silk pajamas, there aren't any three L Lamas. Ah, oh, that's great. So now, in, there's a quote in your book, Buddha is as Buddha does, um, by the Dalai Lama, where he says, it's not enough to meditate and pray, we must also take positive action. Now, this was spoken to an American audience, and I'm wondering, is that activistic orientation, which I think your, your book touches on in a, in mm -hmm. a really nice way, is that particularly American uh, form of Buddhism? Mm -hmm. I want to ask about the Bodhisattva thing because that's what your book's all about. It's kind of like a handbook mm -hmm. for the Bodhisattva based on the teachings of the Buddha. But I, I'm wondering, does, doesn't one have to give up one's job, family, or friends to achieve a, that level of enlightenment? No, of course not. Um, you might have to give up your job. In fact, I think that you are planning to change your life in about a year which is unfortunate since you have this wonderful long-standing radio show. But the Bodhisattva needs to elevate his or her gaze. I mean, as a Buddhist, we don't missionaryize and proselytize and intervene. We only go where invited and teach when asked. But should one feel compelled to do so, should one see and feel intensely the sorry state of our benighted world today, then it's quite obvious that we need to do something and do something a little different and a little more intelligently or wisely in order to become better people and contribute to a better world for us and for the next generations. So it doesn't mean we have to throw away our current bodies and our health or our our cars and homes or our family and jobs, but we could be a little less attached to them or, or invested in the fool's gold of things that don't, in the long run, bring us satisfaction and fulfillment. So Buddha did, never really taught Buddhism, Paul, as I'm sure you, you know. He taught what he called the middle way, which means the golden mean, finding balance and a middle way, moderation. Not a narrow way, but it means being free from extremes such as nihilism, nothingness on one hand, or extreme materialism on the other hand. So the problem is not that we have possessions. The problem is that they have us too much. Right, right. So this Bodhisattva vow, which is characteristic of Mahayana Buddhism, it's not a part of Theravada Buddhism. It is. It, it, is, is, it is. It is. Okay. It's less emphasized in Theravada Southern Buddhist countries, but um, it's a part of all schools of Buddhism. It's a major part of Zen Buddhism and Tibetan Buddhism and a minor part of Theravada Buddhism, but it's basic Buddhism. But I, I really find it interesting the way that you put forth that this is a vow or this is a, an intention that anybody can actualize 
right now in this lifetime. It's not something that an enlightened being decides to do so that they could come back and help us. Right. That, that's my message. And uh, we've spoken before, and I've been here before. You know that my message is always, if I can do it, friends, you can do it. Anybody can do it. I'm nobody special. I'm just a three-sport jock from Long Island. Not the Dalai Lama, not Mother Teresa, not an avatar descended from above. Just a guy who's taken on this path and I feel like is enjoying the results. Which was the Buddha's message from the beginning, the radical message 2,500 years ago that anybody by following such a path could become as wise, as enlightened, as nirvanically peaceful and blissful as the Buddha himself did by bringing such a path into being. Buddha didn't love the word following. He was more advocating spiritual leadership, which is the bodhisattva way to be an enlightened leader. If we follow or bring such a path into being, then we too can become Buddhas to be bodhisattvas and eventually fully enlightened, blissful, saintly, altruistic but beings. Isn't, isn't that, in the normal case, going to require thousands of lifetimes? No, I wouldn't say that. Um, for slow learners like me, perhaps, so I've taken the Bodhisattva <laughs> vow and I had to undergo years of monastic training and philosophy and, you know, three-year meditation retreats and our Lama training and the, my teacher's Tibetan monastery in the East. But in general, we can become a Bodhisattva right now. In fact, it's my thesis that we're all Bodhisattvas right now. We all, I believe, I sincerely believe that everyone that's listening wishes to be a better person and contribute to a better world. And I, and I challenge anyone that's listening, if you, if you don't think so, to call in or to write in, to you know, give your name so that uh, we know who the guilty are. But I'm, sure, <laughs> but I'm sure that when you look into your heart, we all know we want to be better people and contribute to a better world. We may feel hopeless in, about it sometimes. We may feel despair. We may have given up on ourselves. We may be depressed. We may be sad about the violent state of the world today, but that doesn't mean there's no hope. There's always hope, and that's the message of any transformative spiritual path. Redemption is always possible, even for the greatest sinner, not just for ordinary schnooks like us. Now, how would you relate the, the heroic ideal of the Bodhisattva, the spiritual warrior, to parenting or Father's Day? Well, that's a good question. You know, in this book, I talk about the different kinds of Bodhisattvas, the cosmic Bodhisattva archetypes from above, like the female Buddha Tara and all not historical figures, Bodhisattva archetypes, the Manjusri, the, the icon of wisdom, and so forth. Maitreya, the Buddha to come. But then there were historical bodhisattvas like the Buddha, Moses, Jesus, Muhammad, Lao Tzu, Confucius, and so on. And then there were contemporary bodhisattvas, celebrity bodhisattvas, if you like, like the Dalai Lama, Thich Nhat Hanh of Vietnam, Mother Teresa, Albert Schweitzer, Eleanor Roosevelt, Nelson Mandela, Bono of U2 with his great philanthropic works, even Oprah, who's really an icon of generosity, starting children's schools in Africa and giving out by hand tens of thousands of Christmas gifts, not just sending a check, going there and doing it herself. This is bodhisattva, or ultimate altruistic activity. That doesn't mean that they're all fully enlightened, but that's not our issue. Our issue is I believe, how to be better people and contribute to a better world, how to be the Buddhas to be, how to be the leaders that we want to see in the world, how we can step up to the plate, mm -hmm. not wait for the Messiah to come and usher in the so-called kingdom of heaven, how we can step up to the plate, how we can usher people into their seats in the kingdom of heaven right now, not waiting for anything. That's why we are the bodhisattvas. So besides all these cosmic archetype of bodhisattvas, historical lineage masters, and founder bodhisattvas, contemporary bodhisattvas like the Dalai and so forth. They're the everyday hero bodhisattvas in our own life. Like I start this book, chapter one, with Exxon Ken, Ken Reynolds of Ken's Exxon in Woodstock, New York, the, bodhis the gruff redneck with the heart of gold bodhisattva who never chased after the welfare mothers and, and food stamp mothers to pay their gas bills and always filled up their tank with a smile and put it on their account. Mm -hmm. You know, in, in terms of like 
this bodhisattva training, a bodhisattva training, mm -hmm. the Buddhist system, I mean, like you said, the Buddhist yeah. life for how many years? Eight, four, 45, 45 years, years after years. enlightenment. Very extensive system. Mm -hmm. Way more extensive than the Christian body. Not the. Not well, Jesus only taught for three years. Exactly. It's a, look how much he accomplished in those years. Right, and he was teaching illiterates, and Buddha was teaching mm -hmm. a very yeah. illiterate society. So you got forty-five years of co uh, of, of of teachings, mm -hmm. and the, your book is basically focusing on the ten paramitas. Mm -hmm. The Ten Transcendental Virtues of the Bodhisattva. This is like a training manual. This is a training manual, how we can cultivate what we call the Buddhist virtues, the paramitas. Uh, not the paramecium. I know all of my listeners uh, studied Latin, not Sanskrit. Not the Ten Paramecium, the Ten Paramitas. It means virtues that go beyond. Panacean virtues, like selfless giving. The first one is generosity. But not just giving change to a panhandler to move their butt out of our path. <laughs> Selfless giving, caritas in Christianity, self-giving without expecting in return. That's why it's a panacean virtue. And I give exercises and examples how we can learn to recondition ourselves to give without expectation ourselves. This is a panacean virtue of generosity. So each of these paramitas, these original practices, these Buddhist virtues, these panacean virtues helps us to be the Buddhas that we actually are. It says in the Buddhist scriptures, and I'm not just making this up, Paul, you asked me if, uh, you know, like the Dalai Lama was just saying that activism exhortation for Americans because Americans are too speedy to sit and meditate or something. No, not at all. Meditation is only one-third of the Buddhist path. The Buddhist path has three liberating enlightenment trainings, ethical character training, ethical training, morality first. Second, mindfulness and meditation awareness training, cultivating mindfulness in life and while sitting or standing or walking. Mindfulness and meditation awareness training. Second, and third, the wisdom and love training, selfless wisdom, unconditional love training. And this is how we put it together with good deeds outerly, with inner introspection and centering innerly, and then secretly being in touch with the infinite wisdom or the luminosity that it's the heart of all of us. And in this book, and I venture to say this is the only place in uh, Western language you can read about this, using the Tibetan analysis of the outer, inner, and secret or innermost mystical levels of the Buddhist teachings and Buddhist virtues, I explain each of these according th to this sort of the letter of the law, the behavioral out outer way of practicing, the spirit of the law, the inner way, and then the ultimate intent or the mystical meaning of it, the oneness level, the secret level, in which all the virtues really stem from oneness and from enlightenment, from the inner light itself that's at the heart of all of us. That's why it says in the Buddhist scriptures that we're all Buddhas by nature, not Buddhists, God forbid, that we're all Buddhas by nature. We only have to awaken to who and what we truly are. That's the meaning of enlightenment. That's the meaning of the Zen Japanese term satori, breakthrough. That's the meaning of self-realization, illumination, to realize who and what we truly are and to become who and what we truly are and can be. Just being ourselves is not enough. You know, the New Age slogan, be yourself, is fine. But until we know who we are, just being our bent out of shape, neurotic, or worse, psychotic, pathological, addictive selves is not good enough. We have to be our true selves with a capital S, our excellent selves with a capital E, and so forth, our, our, our happy, joyous selves with a capital F for fun, etc. I'm just playing here. Mm -hmm. Buddhism is more fun, as I always say. Now, in the, the book is uh, about the, these ten transcendental <laughs> virtues and the perfecting of these, which are sometimes even called the Ten Perfections, I think. Ten Perfections, but that's too perfectionistic for me. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. I that's mean, why I cast them as pra transformative practices. I see. Okay. But is there, just in general, is there any, what is the danger of, of people uh, becoming what uh, Trungpa called spiritual materialists, you know, storming the gates of un enlightenment? Well, that's why we shouldn't... Um, Think too much about the goal, actually, but take it one step at a time, like any good coach or teacher or trainer can tell us, not worrying about the whole staircase, just trying to get our feet on the first step, the second step, the third step, one at a time. And thus, the Buddhist mindfulness and awareness cultivation practices of living in the present moment, learning to breathe and be aware of breathing, learning to listen and 
hear what we're hearing and see what we're seeing, getting ourselves clear and simplifying our lives, being in the present moment, being more focused and concentrated. That's why meditation and introspection is so helpful. We can get more concentrated and see things as they are, not as we would like them to be or think they should be. See it as it is, not as we are with our projections and interpretations. So according to Buddhism, reality is things just as they are. Mm-hmm. Wisdom is seeing things as they are. This is encoded in the Buddhist original teachings, the, the Eightfold Path. The first step on the Eightfold Path is right view or clear vision, seeing things as they are, not as they ain't. This is something anybody can learn to do. Buddha, like I said, he didn't ask people to follow him. He didn't tell people, and he, he told people not to make images of him or worship him. That this is about bhavana, cultivation, to bring into being all that we have within us. Now. <laughs> One of the ten paramitas, one of the ten transcendental virtues, is uh, what you call heroic effort. Mm-hmm. How does that correlate with the Eightfold Path, the, the, the right effort? Yeah, good question. Well, because Buddhism comes from ancient days, from oral culture, when everything was memorized, these little lists of mnemonic devices to help people remember it and pass it down, like the Ten Commandments and so forth. Remember, Buddhism is older than Christianity and Islam. So the Eightfold Path, the, the fifth step on it is called, um, if I remember, no, sixth step. I mean, who's counting? The sixth step is called wise effort or rise, uh, right effort, balanced effort. That doesn't always mean sweating and striving like the mountain climber, like Lance Armstrong. It also knows means it also means knowing when to relax, how to float, how to soar on the updraft like a hawk, and so on. So wise effort means balanced effort as appropriate. That's in the eightfold path. In the level of paramitas, however, right effort is. And this is just the translation. The fourth paramita is called virya paramita. Virya means heroic or joyous, enthusiastic, energetic. Mm. So it's a notion of like joyous effort, sort of like the passion that we have for our greatest love or hobby, mm-hmm. or like playing with children. How? We, let me switch metaphors. You know the way that, like, I, mean, I have a dog. I'm a dog lover. I mean, cats are okay. They're a little deficient. But dogs, now dogs are perfect in my religion. Not Buddhism. So my dog will come and chase the ball and bring it back, you know, until it dies. And that's that's like the kind of endless, well, it's kind of limited. <laughs> no, but that's what we say, balanced effort. Mm-hmm. But when we're doing what's really worth doing, like loving our children has no end. That should happen until we die. That's all I'm saying. Yeah, yeah, no, I- until we die. That shouldn't change, even if we're tired of them, even if we don't like what they do, even if they become, you know, bad people, which, you know, bad things happen to good people. Still, we have to love them. We will love them. That's because who we are. Mm -hmm. So the Bodhisattva has enthusiastic, joyous perseverance and heroic, courageous effort. Even if we're the last Bodhisattva altruist in the planet, we still know that selfishness is severely limited and altruism is the source of all goodness and happiness. So this is why effort is so important, but it doesn't just mean striving and working hard. It's more the panacean virtue of joyous enthusiasm based on our motiva- inner motivation and um, commitment and dedication, let's say, because we know what's important, therefore we keep doing it anyway, even if there's no outer uh, approval or confirmation. Mm-hmm. Now, it seems to me that these ten virtues are... For some people, they're not they're hardly available because those people are suffering from low self-esteem. Or mm-hmm. They think they were born in sin or yeah, they need to be right, saved. Right. What is your advice to people? Well, that's why I say we have to begin with the first step, not think about them as ten perfections. It seems like too much. You know, these are not that different from the seven cardinal virtues of Catholicism and other codes of conduct, the Boy Scout and Girl Scout code and so on. But these are... The, show you a way of putting them into practice, which is the kind of, again, I don't want to say, you know, Buddhism is unique or special, but Buddhism is a tried and true method of cultivating and bringing into being all that we are and can be. So there are methods for reconditioning these hang-ups that you mentioned, like low Mm self-esteem or feeling like the victim or who am I to do it, you know? I'm not um, Princess Di, I'm not Oprah, I'm not Bono. How can I help the poor people? Well, 
in my book, I've written about different examples. Like I mentioned, Ken of the Exxon Station. That's how he helped people, by being generous. Um, on the other hand, Mother Teresa is a case well known. Mother Teresa, who the heck did she, did she think she was to take on the world? She was a four-foot-tall nun from Albania. But somehow she managed to devote her whole life to helping the poorest people in the world and started a whole order of people who are helping the poorest people in the world. So I think it depends on being in touch with inner abundance and inner contentment and overcoming our greed and feelings of scarcity and poverty and realizing that we have so much love to give. We have to find a gift and learn to give it. You know, love comes from loving, not from getting it from others. So this is how we practice cultivating the love by f finding those we can love and practicing loving and getting it moving small steps at a time. If we even begin just with one virtue like generosity, giving of ourself and our time, not just a little bit of donation or, or, or food to a hungry person, you know, but if we can really help somebody, like the Ch Chang Su, the Chinese philosopher of old said, if you teach a man to fish, what did he say? If you give a man a fish, he'll eat for a day. He'll eat for a day. If you teach a man to fish, his, vi his village will eat for generations. Mm -hmm. So if we can give them the wisdom with the knowledge, the real help to get a leg up themselves, that's going to last a lot longer than just turning over our trust fund to them or, you, or, or our welfare system. Now, you mentioned wisdom again, and, uh, and I'd like to touch on that because as we were talking before the interview, that there is a real uh, wisdom gap in our culture. Yes. Can you speak to that? Well, wisdom seems to have short, little currency today. Uh, and even in, in philosophy classes and so on, you know, nobody's looking for, to the philosophers for wisdom anymore. I live in Cambridge with my wife and dog <laughs> in Cambridge, Massachusetts. Every once in a while, they let me walk through the, the schoolyard at Harvard, you know, to, like, raise my IQ a few points. They don't let me in the buildings. But, you know, I walk through and I walk in through the lintel and the, oh, the stone lintel over the gateway it says enter here for wisdom and it's a real reminder about how little wisdom we learn today in higher education it's more vocational training and this is a huge down you know downturn philosophy used to be about seeking for wisdom and, and life wisdom living wisdom socrates to, to know thyself and it was threatening that's why he was forced to commit suicide he was actually executed by the powers that be for corrupting the youth of Athens, the father of Western philosophy, executed by the powers that be. So we have to look into ourselves and see if we feel compelled to develop kind of spiritual intelligence or more discriminating wisdom and discernment, not just information and knowledge, but deeper understanding, insight, realization, self-realization, and so on. Like Lao Tzu, author of the wisest book ever written, I believe, The Tao Te Ching, and I recommend it, translated by Stephen Mitchell, Tao Te Ching. Lao Tzu says, to know the world, to know others is knowledge, to know oneself is wisdom. And this is not narcissism, friends. To know ourselves is the beginning of of the knowledge of truth. So I think today we need to be inculcating and training ourselves and each other and our new, younger generations in wisdom and gather what wisdom we've learned from our experiences so we can become wise elders, not just jaded old fools that know everything, know everything and understand so little. So we can become wise wisdom elders, learning from our experiences and pass it on to the next generation. Otherwise this world is gonna continue a, a, it's tailspin in, in, a, in a dark place I'm afraid we don't have a lot of time left unfortunately because there's so much to talk about and there's so much more substance in the book that would be uh, uh, fun to talk about but let's just ask what advice would you give people who want to connect with their with spiritual lives but don't know where to begin how to form a personal spiritual practice aside from reading your book which I'm going to definitely recommend what, what would you advise? We all have the spirit within us, however we conceive of it. We're all God's creatures to talk English. All beings are endowed with the luminous Buddha nature to talk Buddhist. 
The Quaker founder, George Fox, called it the inner light. We're all spiritual beings trying to learn how to live here on earth, not just human beings or animals trying to become spiritual. We're all living spiritual beings. We all have a good heart underneath it all, the little Buddha, the baby Jesus inside, the inner child underneath the persona and all. Let's slow down and find our spiritual center and look a little deeper and see we might like who we find many people are afraid to be alone or look inside that they're going to find something they don't like let me tell you friends the the inner light the, the natural state of being is a gorgeous magnificent thing on the practical level why not just go outside and take a and, and connect with nature a little more that's the original form of spirituality which puts a perspective on us and we realize that many of our preoccupations are very p local, petty and temporary and we see how small we are in the light of the vast universe and yet we fit in and that everything is right here within us. So connect with nature, live a healthy, balanced life. I'm not advocating necessarily any particular form. I'm not telling you you have to be a vegetarian or you have to meditate. But if you take on some spiritual practice, not just belief, you know, it's fine to go to church once a week, but what about the other six and a half days of the week? We need to have something to bring, integrate into our lives, like loving kindness, compassion, and generosity, some of these Buddhist-type virtues, which are also Jesus' virtues. Like mindful living, and try to take up a meditation, a yoga, a tai chi practice, could be very, or prayer could be very helpful. Just pick something. If you take up one practice and do it regularly, I guarantee it will transform your life. If not, you can get your money back from Paul O'Brien here at Pathways. <laughs> that's right. Hey, well, listen, that's just about all the time we have, but um, I want to uh, let our listeners know how they can find out more about the book and about your work. Uh, the book is Buddha Is As Buddha Does by Lama Surya Das, our guest today on Pathways. Do you have a website? Yes, my website is surya.org, S-U-R-Y-A, www.surya.org. That's linked to my Dzogchen Center website. That's linked to my blog, my YouTubes. I have a lot of articles archived at beliefnet.com. All of this is on the web, free for the picking. I also have some audio tapes, yoga videos, chant CDs, and so forth. So look at my website, surya.org, or Google my name, Surya Das, and you'll find myself, my colleagues, and hopefully you'll find something that's good for you. As we say, Buddha is as Buddha does, and you, but it's your own spiritual practice that can become like the wish-fulfilling jewel that you seek. Thank you so much for being with us today, Lama Surya Das. Thank you, Paul. Blessings to one and all. And thank you for, for talking with us about your new book, Buddha Is As Buddha Does, uh, by Lama Surya Das, available at all the finer bookstores in the Portland area. A great read, a very educational book on how to develop a spiritual practice no matter what your religion is. And full of stories and, and anecdotes. Stories. And uh, a great topic for Pathways. I want to thank all our listeners for tuning in this Sunday and hopefully every week at this time for a visit with leaders in personal and cultural transformation. On behalf of KBOO-FM 90.7 on your dial and the Pathways program, this is Paul O'Brien signing off.